Well, it's your brother Bob out here in the desert uh, coming into Jerusalem just for a little while. You keep, you got to ask why, Bob, why? Why are you out here answering questions that nobody's even asking? Uh, well, I've got to ask, why is nobody asking about the coming of Christ without a big argument going on? I'm trying to find out exactly what Jesus said and to communicate to you exactly what Jesus said in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. I, I hope that you are with me on this. Let's talk about the rapture. What? You mean there is a rapture in Matthew 20? Oh, yes, yes. We haven't done away with the rapture, uh, although we should never have called it that because it has confused millions of people. 24, 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Mark 13, 27, and then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the end of the earth to the end of heaven. Luke, but when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. I suppose the Luke passage should come first. The heavens go crazy. Jesus appears in the sky. And that's the time to look up because you will be lifted up soon to be with him in the air and on the earth. Here indeed is the much talked of rapture, the seizing up of the church into the sky after having been gathered from all over the planet and wherever humans are. That's exactly what it says here. And this passage meshes perfectly with the other scriptures that talk of his coming, but have been hijacked by those who see him secretly coming seven years earlier. Consider, for example, the trumpet blast, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. We will be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the trumpet of God. Do we believe in a rapture? A catching away of, of the bride to Jesus? Of course we do. And here it is. The angels, the trumpets, the catching up, the gathering together. That is the rapture. The prophetic utterance now is finished. But Jesus continues the discourse with a series of warnings. Take note, even though he has been very specific, even though he has given clear-cut signs described in detail, the events of that day of his coming, he still tells the disciples of every age to watch because they don't know when all of this might start. Matthew 24, now learn the parable of the fig tree. As soon as its branch has become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know the summer is near. And so you too, when you see all these things, recognize that he is near, right at the door. Mark, now learn the parable from the fig tree. As soon as its branch has become tender and sprouts its leaves, you know that summer is near. And so you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near, right at the door. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree. This is Luke. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they put forth leaves, you see for yourselves and you know that summer is now near. So you too, when you see these things happening, recognize that the kingdom of God is near. Inspired Luke heard from Paul or the Lord himself that Jesus speaks of his coming and the coming of the kingdom of God as one and the same thing. He comes to establish the kingdom long foretold by the prophets. And when the disciples see all these things happen, it is near. All what things? Certainly not the vague and untraceable signs of the first section of the prophecy. But when you see Jerusalem's demise, followed by a three-year reign of evil, followed by a breakdown of nature, Jesus is about to return. We're to watch for these things to happen with excitement, but not keep assuming that any of these pieces alone is the sign of his coming. All these things, Jesus said, when you see all these things. Until then, we know that our own coming to him is uncertain and comes with no warning. This fact alone 
should be enough to keep Christians pure and holy before him. Not the fact that he might come to me today, but I might go to him today. And then the final generation in 24, 34. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. 1330. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. 2132. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all things take place. The gospel, people are certainly in accord right here, as throughout the discourse. But what does Jesus mean? What he could not have meant was the generation he was speaking to. That era has long passed away, and certainly all these things have not taken place. Is he speaking of the Jewish people in general? That's a weak suggestion. This generation, just the Jewish people, I think that's weak. Well, then he must be talking about the application of the parable that he has just given the disciples. There's a fig tree generation, a generation that will see the rise of Antichrist and his enthroning of himself in that new Jewish temple. A generation that will experience unprecedented horrors, probably of a nuclear sort, or weapons yet to be created that are even more horrific. A generation that will see a rise of false prophets, signs and wonders, fake miracles, even more than at present. A generation that will watch nature go off course and Satan's power over mankind broken. That generation will continue on until all that is prophesied shall be fulfilled. In God's eternal word, 2435, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The very exact same words in Mark and in Luke. Of course, true. But why does he say that here? Nothing will keep his word from coming to pass. The heavens will grow shaky, the earth, too, will be shaken. The generation that sees them fall apart also will pass away. But what I have told you, Jesus says, will happen. Write it down. Pass it on. Every detail of what I have said is important and to be taught to my people. Let no one pass over these words as just another theory of men or something to fight about. I've spoken. I will do it. And after all of this definite talk, the next words of Jesus surprise us. And yet they are the ones most quoted out of this entire passage. When you get talking about this, this is what people will quote. 2436, about that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. Same in in uh, Mark, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the son, but the father alone. Same thing. I wonder how many have dropped out of their interest in last things by reading only this line and not studying in detail all the rest. Jesus did not say we cannot know the time when the time comes. He said, we don't know when that final season will be. We don't know the day for sure. We don't know the hour for sure. Think of it. The Father knows perfectly well when everything will wrap up. But if he had communicated that to us, what would the people living in all of those centuries have thought? Well, my Lord delays his coming. There'd be a temptation in some to let up. Why give us this long description, though, if the timing of his coming doesn't matter at all? I ask this of those who feel that watching football games and, and knowing everybody's golf scores is tremendously more important than the coming of our Lord to set up his kingdom. I want to be well uh, in this, well in, informed in this matter because the disciples asked the question, and Jesus gave a precise answer. 
And if I do happen to be living in the generation that sees all this happen, I'll know exactly what I'm looking for. For sure, if I'm not, I won't be ooing and aahing at, at every headline or every earthquake and shouting out, he's coming. Of course he's coming. But have you looked at this prophecy to figure out when? Have you tried? Do you care? And if you haven't figured it out, are you watching carefully for his return and living a life pleasing to him? He is coming back. The writers now take uh, divergent directions, some having heard one warning from Jesus, some another. And together they form an important message for us, but not a message that should dampen our desire to know exactly when Jesus will return. It's a wonderful mystery. And it's, it's in here. It's, it's, it's spelled out. Again, the day and the hour, no, but the season is so very clear. And we need to know, are we even in that season? We'll talk about that in uh, videos to come. Thank you so much for sharing with me today. It's always good when you're here. I mean, if you weren't here, what would I be doing? <laughs> be out here by myself even more so. And sometimes you're not here. So please do come back. And, and when you do, or before you come back, in between times, would you go over to my website? Check out some of those audios there. Would you go over to Facebook and click on my uh, little piece there? See the kind of things that I'm doing, my timeline. And, uh, and then contact me and we'll talk about local things that are going on, especially these Zoom meetings. I do want you to come to those. If you're a man, it's uh, Saturday nights at seven. Men or women come noon Tuesdays. We do have a couple of good things going right there. And I would love to have more of you with us. There's my contact information. I hope to see you soon. God bless you. And uh, as I like to say on the audios, this is the Hackberry House of Chosun. Lord willing, we'll talk again real soon. Bye-bye.